Hello, and welcome back to the PNN. My name is Parker Taft. Today, today we are going to be talking about mental fatigue, what to do when your brain is too tired to think. Now, I'm sure many people of you are thinking, mental fatigue, isn't that something that you find when, you know, people are sick or injured or something like that? And that's obviously true. And others will be asking, isn't that something you do after coming through something like high stress, like say your SATs or uh, getting ready for prom or something like that? And again, entirely, completely true. But what we're talking about today is the everyday humdrum mental fatigue. The fatigue that you experience when you wake up, you know, either really late in the day or really early in the morning and you feel tired and sluggish and muddle-headed, or when you're working really hard on something and all of a sudden you can't concentrate on it anymore, or you're up late night pulling an all-nighter trying to study for that exam you should have been studying for a month in advance. And you just find yourself repeating the same line over and over and over again. That's what we're talking about today, and how it can have some negative impacts, both on your physical and mental health, and how to, at first, avoid it, and if, if you can't avoid it, to overcome those issues. So, let us begin. Also, I'm trying something new. You guys will have to leave a comment on whether you like how I'm mixing up and changing the way I'm presenting these information formats. I'm going to be doing a little experimenting in the next couple of weeks on how I present this stuff, so please, all feedback is welcome. But Without side note aside, let us continue. So, what is mental fatigue? Well, its official definition is a condition triggered by prolonged cognitive activity. Basically, it sends your brain into overdrive, leaving you exhausted and hampering your productivity and overall cognitive function. What's prolonged cognitive activity, you ask? Basically, it's using your brain a lot. You know, like working on that math test or taking the SAT. Now, that is a very mentally fatiguing and highly cognitive intensive activity. I should know, I took it four times. So in reality, outside of Eng English speak and science speak, it's the muddled haze you feel in your mind after you've worked hard, typically mentally, typically it's a mental task, just like after you do, you do a lot of physical work, whether that's exercising or doing yard work or something like that, your muscles feel uh, physically fatigued brain can have the same thing, although it's called mental fatigue, on some project or piece of work. The feeling that your brain just won't function properly, no matter how much you try to focus on something, you feel distracted and, you know, muddle-headed and in a haze, and like this gentleman here trying to walk in the picture below, trying to walk through that very thick fog bank, a fog bank that is, what my grandfather was said, as thick as pea soup and could be cut by a knife. So, that is what mental fatigue is, for those of you who didn't understand the term. So what causes mental fatigue? Poor diet. Uh, the fast foods and energy drinks are good now, but you know, 10, 20 years, they're really going to hit you. But even now, they're not that necessarily healthy for you. It can lead you into feeling less energy, less motivated, lethargic, tired, especially if you've eaten a lot of it. You know, everyone... When you were little, your mother said, don't eat so much candy, you're going to end up with a sugar high. And you didn't listen, and you ate all that candy, and you had a sugar high, and you were bouncing off the walls, and you felt like you were you know, energetic, and nothing could stop you. And then half an hour later, you were cocked out on the couch because you were tired. A good image to describe that would be the lower one, which also ties in with our second lack of sleep. It says that the average American loses about an hour of sleep per night, which tallies up to about two weeks a year of lost sleep. Now, I don't know about you, but losing two weeks of sleep, I think, would make me very angry. And that's the average American. Crazy. And, you know, you've seen, you know, the toddler or the little kid who missed his nap time and then conks out in the middle of dinner and is sleeping soundly on the kitchen table or on the park bench. Well, they've been both probably mentally and physically fatigued for their little bodies, and even though it was an exciting and fun day for them, they're tired now, and all they want to do is sleep. And in our humdrum, everyday, fast-paced society, a lot of people don't give a lot of credit to the reinvigorating and healing power of sleep. Sleep is a wonderful thing. It can cleanse you of a lot of 
worries, concerns, fears, transgressions, and sins. And I know this is a bit of a tangent, but whenever I have a major decision that I don't need to answer right, right away, like they give me you know, two or three days to make a major decision, I always sleep on it. Because I always am able to weigh my options and then I go to sleep and put it out of my mind and just rest and look at it again the next day. And then comp I typically write down my decision on the first day and on the second day after I had my night's sleep, I reevaluate what I was thinking so that I can make a proper, well thought out decision without the effects of mental fatigue creeping in on my decision process and just making a decision out of hand just to get it over and done with. Hormonal imbalance, that's not really something you can control, especially all you teenagers out there or pre-adolescents going into your teenage years. The, it's just a part of your general maturation process, which I'm sure you'll learn about in health class. So not something you really can control, but you can use other tips and tricks, which you'll find out later in this video, to help keep you in balance and counteract those stubborn little hormones. Uh, mental stress, something really bad happened, or something that you think is really bad happened. Uh, that can put a lot of mental stress on you. You know, it can be anything from you had a fight with your parents, to so-and-so didn't sit with you at lunch, to oh my god, the, my house burnt down. That, there's all sources of mental stress, which can lead to mental fatigue, especially prolonged periods of mental stress. Uh, athletes experience this, especially in high stakes, high intensity sports seasons. Soldiers, one of the contributing factors of PTSD is actually believed to be mental fatigue, because soldiers have prolonged levels of mental stress, you know, worrying about the lives of their comrades and their own lives and whether they're gonna get back home. And then you have decision fatigue, which comes a lot, and uh, Americans especially, because we do have a lot of options, a lot more options when compared with the rest of the world, for consumer products, uh, political, social, ideological choices. Our polygot nation, a, a melting pot of ideas, peoples, and beliefs, can often leave us with decision fatigue. It's when there's too many decisions. You know, wake up in the morning, the first decision you have to make is whether I'm going to get out of bed or not. Then, what am I going to have for breakfast? What am I going to get dressed with? You know, and you go throughout the day, and many people think it's the big decisions that cause decision fatigue, which is not. It's the tiny decisions. What coffee should I order? What sandwich should I get? What shirt should I wear? All those little decisions, you know, fatigue your mind, and you, your, your brain and yourself get tired of making all those micro and mini decisions after a while. So when it comes to the big decisions, you're more likely to take a more rash, approach and not thoroughly look at all your options or choices to a particular problem or issue and do a lot more decision making out of hand and in a rash, you know, spur of the moment, which sometimes can be a good thing, but most of the time is very bad, especially in interpersonal relations. Whenever you're communicating with someone, you need to be well thought out and fully aware of your actions and the decisions you're taking in regard to your relationship with that particular person you're in instructing or talking with, whether it's the boss, employee, employee, boss, parent, child, child, parent, teacher, student, etc, etc. And then there's attention fatigue. Uh, this happens when you keep shifting your attention from multiple things, thus why multi multitasking is completely false and bogus. Can't happen. Because you're constantly shifting your attention from one thing to another to another, your brain can't focus on and do one task at a time, so your brain feels sort of like scattered, and you, when you try to focus on one thing, your brain was just switching from multiple different things, so your brain isn't ready to sort of calm down. It's like a hyperactive child on candy. After you give him the candy, he's on a sugar high, he's not ready to calm down. Now, after a half an hour, an hour, when that sugar has sort of left his system and he's now tired and drowsy, then he's calmed down. But same thing with multitasking with your brain. Your brain's pointing all over the place, phone, music, homework, uh, computer game, YouTube, back to homework. So when you actually try to sit down and focus on something, you find your brain's all over the place. And then there's the other type of attention fatigue, which comes from people who highly focus on something for a long period of time. And that's why they advise, you know, for every hour of work that you do, you take maybe like a five minute mental break, just 
step away from whatever task you're doing just so your brain has a chance to you know fully comprehend what you're doing think through it and sort of calm down and separate yourself from it so it doesn't get fatigued from focusing on it for too long and many high school and college students who have taken all-nighters can attest to this that with a combination of lack of sleep and trying to focus intently on one thing, let's say it's physics in this instance, and teach yourself an entire semester's worth of physics in one night. Not going to happen because your brain can only pay attention to something for a set period of time, and after that it begins to wander. That's why whenever you know you study intently and then you reach the point where you're just like, you're reading the same line over and over and over again, and it's not clicking, it's not making sense, it, and you're wondering like, why can't my brain think? I've, I've done this, I've known this. That's because your brain's basically reach its attention breaking point and it can't focus any longer and that's the point you shouldn't reach that point before you take a break you should regularly schedule breaks so you don't reach that point but once you reach that point you you won't be able to effectively work and then there's overwork you have too much work to do and you haven't managed your time well enough to make sure you get all your tasks done at the, in that particular time so you're stressing out about that on top of trying to get the work done and then there's illness. You know, illness, mental fatigue, and physical fatigue are common symptoms in a multitude of illnesses across the medical spectrum, which I'm not going to get into here, but suffice it to say. So, why mental fatigue is bad? Well, according to psychology today, the more mentally tired we become, the less capable we are of keeping up with the demands of the day. It becomes harder to make healthy decisions, stay focused on tasks, and remain calm. It can also become difficult to regulate our emotions. Over time, mental exhaustion can lead to full-blown burnout, physical issues, and stress-related illnesses. But as soon as you realize why you are feeling so tired, you can take steps to restore and feel better fast. That's what we're here to talk about today, aren't we? The more mentally tired, basically the more mentally tired you come, you become, the harder it is to make good, healthy choices and enjoy life, leading to mental and physical breakdowns if not addressed. Symptoms of mental fatigue can include physical fatigue, patience and irritability, and an inability to concentrate and focus. Now, I am neither a medical doctor nor a psychologist, so I cannot diagnose or offer any medical advice in the terms of mental fatigue. But the coming advice is what I've been able to read from Psychology Today, Forbes Magazine, Lifehack.org, and several others sites which I found informative and helpful, providing helpful advice on this particular topic. And again, it is not the end-all be-all. That's why I always have the further reading tab under my in the description of these videos so you guys can look at articles to further your information and further explore the topic and find what works for you. So, how to avoid mental fatigue? Because like that circle with the slash, we don't want mental fatigue in our lives, or at least try to limit it as much as possible. So, one, stop low-yield activities. Now, you may be saying, what are low-yield activities? Basically, activities that don't work towards your goals, your dreams, whether that's, you know, graduating from college or getting that thesis paper done. And it amounts to, you know, scrolling through social media mindlessly, watching YouTube mindlessly, watching Netflix mindlessly. Uh, checking your email every 10 minutes. It's the fluff that you fill up your day with. Uh, going for coffee every hour on the hour. Wandering about aimlessly. Those are like low-yield activities. They're, they're not working towards anything productive. No, there may be some emails that are important. There may be some social media posts or YouTube videos that you find especially interesting. But that's not the point. They're not yielding as much results as it would be if you sat down and you were, you know, reading intently and researching your thesis paper, or you were calling clients uh, or future clients and talking to them about your business, which would have a higher yield towards your own personal, well, higher yield towards your business or own personal development. Use the time box technique. From what I know, this started out as a software technique, actually, for software programmers. And basically, you set aside a specific time block when you will do tasks, basically, in this particular case, low yield tasks, or tasks that are not top priority, and are not focused directly on your mission, and stick to the time limit that you set. So you say you have an hour, all right, from 11 a.m. to 12 p.m., that's all I'm going to do. I'm going to check my emails, and once it hits 12 p.m., you close out, time out, 
you're done with it for however long it is until the next time period for which you've scheduled it. And you go back to doing high yield, productive tasks, stuff that help you get towards your goals, your dreams. And supposedly it's a very highly effective t technique because it destroys perfectionist tendencies and overthinking while helping you to better manage your time. You see many people when they're doing even low yield tasks uh, are highly, you know, it has to be perfect perfectionist. Which isn't very good in getting stuff done efficiently because, as they say, it's better to go with a good plan now than a perfect plan later. And I think it hold, that uh, phrase rings true. And then reduce your sleep debt. This is important, especially for teenagers. Set yourself a bedtime, go to, and a wake up time, and adhere to it regularly. And I mean, like, almost all the time, like maybe only once or twice a week, stray outside of it, and that's on the weekends. So you can establish your circadian rhythm so that you can go to sleep and wake up at proper time so you make sure you get enough sleep and don't go into sleep debt. And sleep when you're tired, especially if you're feeling sick or fatigued physically or mentally. Sleep is the best healer or rejuvenator. If there's one thing that you take away from this video is that sleep is a very, very important tool in your self-care, self-help toolbox. In addition, don't be afraid to take naps. I know many of us think, oh, naps are for little kids or older people, but hey, uh, entire cultures have built in nap times. We're looking at you, Spain, Portugal, parts of Italy. If they can do it, why can't we? Learn to do non nothing once in a while. In our every ever increasing and high, highly fast paced society, we think that it's bad or we're lazy to just be idle for a little while, which it isn't. Sometimes you just need some time to relax, unwind, be yourself and not have to worry about doing anything. It gives your mind a chance to just unwind, you know, do something mindless, play a board game, watch a movie, now, don't do this all the time, because then you'll be very unproductive, but set aside some time for the, during the week, like maybe maybe hour, hour and a half a day in the evenings before you go to bed, and maybe read your favorite fiction book or watch a comedy. You know, something that brings a smile to your face, but also doesn't require an intense amount of focus or intellectual thought. And the last ones are eat healthy and exercise. As I said before, diet is critical on both your physical and mental health, and exercise has been proven to improve your mental state as well as your physical state by getting blood flowing, waking up the mind, and helping you purge both negative feelings and negative thoughts from your system. In addition to strengthening the body, you both also strengthen the mind. So, how to overcome mental fatigue if you end up in the situation with mental fatigue? Like Psychology Today said, once you identify that you have it, it's, if you're not too far down the road, it's easy to come back from. If you're pretty far down the road, like almost on the event of a mental breakdown, then I advise seeking professional help for that. But in the case that you're you know, only just starting to realize that you have mental fatigue, these are some few choices and options that you have to reverse course like and overcome it like the mountain climber in the image above so one make fewer decisions you know limit your options so you don't your mind doesn't always have to be making those micro decisions which tire it as i mentioned earlier you know set out your clothes uh the day ahead the night ahead i should say so Say you have a meeting tomorrow and you need a suit, but you're not sure what suit you want. So the night before you go in, take out the, you make your decision regarding your suit, press it, steam it, hang it up. And then the next day, all you have to do is put it on. You don't have to worry about making that decision. Uh, make your coffee, have your coffee machine scheduled to make coffee at a certain time at a certain temperature. And then there, you're done. Pre-make your breakfast and your lunch. So you don't have to have the agony of making a decision regarding that. Organize your emails so you don't have to make a decision regarding its, its priority. 
the emails will go based on your settings to the inbox that you prioritize. So you get an email from Starbucks talking about a new coffee. Now that will be a lower priority than one from your boss saying that there's a meeting tomorrow. And then exercise regularly. A piece of advice from Darren Hardy, a mentor of mine, is take mini breaks throughout the day to stretch, jog in place, do push-ups, anything to get you moving. It's recommended every two hours. Just something to get the blood flowing. Because many people think, oh, I can exercise for you know, half an hour, 45 minutes an hour. Even those people who sit, sit and work out for four hours, how they do it, I don't know. And they think, oh, I've gotten all my movement in for the day. But really, our bodies weren't built to stay still for, stay still for prolonged periods of time. And that's why older people usually their bodies start to de decay. Not literally. But, you know, their bodies start to break down, both from their age and because of that, they do less activity, which means their bodies break down more, which means they do less activity. That's why you see more active uh, older people in a healthier situation than those who are less active, which you would think would be the inverse. But, so, you know, it doesn't need to be much, but just something to get you know, the blood flowing to wake your body back up. Uh, take regularly scheduled and frequent breaks. I think I already emphasized the importance of that to prevent attention fatigue. Uh, stick your head outside every once in a while. It's told that nature has been shown to improve mood and mental state. You know, seeing greenery and the natural world, maybe because we evolved that way, you know, to survive in the natural environment and move about in it. Stay organized. Time management is critical. And I recommend you going back to one of my 30-day challenge videos where I talked about time management and discussed how to stay organized in that regard. And another piece of advice is organize your tasks. So uh, you have your six top tasks that you have to do for that day. So the night before, you write down those six top tasks, and then when you wake up in the morning, you do those six tasks before you do anything else. Any of the low-yield activities, you do those six tasks. That way, you make sure they get done. Uh, be, re be realistic, you know, set realistic goals and for those tasks and dreams and stuff like that. Uh, meditate frequently. It is great for mental health, as science has proven. And again, I referenced one of my 30-day uh, challenge videos to go back and watch the importance of meditation. And then take procrastination and worrying head on. Is all this worrying and stalling really worth it? Is procrastinating on that project really going to make you better at it? Not really. Actually, science shows that uh, the more time people spend worrying or procrastinating on a task is actually more than the time it takes to actually complete the task. So it's really not productive, and it, you're wasting both your time and your future self's time, because you're eventually going to have to do it. You know, the inevitable is the inevitable. So it's better just to get it done now and over with. You get the worry, you get the stress out of the way, and you can focus on what you want to do, your goals, your dreams. So, that wraps up our video for today. As always, here are my sources and further reading, which will also be included in the video description below. If you like this video, don't forget to like and subscribe. In the comments below, tell me how you liked the new video format. I'll be trying a couple others throughout the, the coming weeks, and I'd like your input. And I'm always open to any advice on topics you think I should cover or ways I can improve this channel. As always, this channel is for you and for your benefit, as well as helping guide me along my own personal development adventure. I'm also looking for content creators and contributors to help us all on our journeys of self-development. So, as always, this is the PNN Broadcast, signing off.